sip of your coffee. <laughs> yeah, you did a good coffee this morning. Where are we off to today? Uh, Goula. Yeah, Goula Airfield. What are we doing? Uh, going for a burger fly. Like burger fly. Yeah. Going for the old hundred dollar hamburger. Yeah. We're going with Patrick. He's an Air Force cadets instructor. I haven't seen him since I was probably 13. He's spent 18 years and he's built this RV-10. Got back in contact with him and thanked him for his time as an instructor. And he ran an air traffic control course. And we got to live on the RAF base for a week. And yeah, we've been trying to catch up. So today's the day we get to catch up. It'd be amazing to see like the, the the amount of time and effort he's put in and over the years. An RV-10 is a pretty premium sort of kit built plane, like pretty high level of finish. G'day everyone, uh, my name is Patrick. Um, I built this aircraft, it's a Vans Aircraft RV-10 and uh, it's built by Vans Aircraft based in Oregon in the USA. It comes as a multiple piece kit, basically four kits. The empennage kit, which is the back end, tail cone and the elevator, horizontal stabiliser, rudder and vertical stabiliser. The second kit is the wing kit, so it comes in the left and right wing. And then there's a fourth kit, which is a fuselage kit, which is basically from the tail cone to here, which is the firewall. And then the fourth kit is the finishing kit, which includes the wheels, undercarriage, engine mounts and a lot of the pipe work for the engine. Yep. The engine is uh, an IO540. It was a uh, custom built by uh, an aircraft engine firm in the USA, Barrett's Performance Engines. It uh, uses 110 low lead avgas fuel and um, it has a, a horsepower performance of 260 horsepower. And um, the propeller is a Hartzell two blade propeller. Yeah. And it's an aluminium propeller, and uh, they can also be fitted with three blade propellers from Hartzell, which are aluminium, or a lot of other options are to put uh, composite propellers. Okay. The advantage uh, between a three blade and a two blade is a bit more aesthetic than and performance wise. They don't really perform much differently, but uh, they are significantly varied in cost. The three blade obviously costs more. The other advantage of a three blade is because of its diameter, it's a, sh a smaller diameter. Uh, blade which gives you better ground clearance but only by about an inch and a half. Uh -huh. um, the aircraft uh, is essentially it's up to you to finish the aircraft off how you want in terms of uh, whatever sort of aesthetic things you want to put on differently so I've put on fairings, I've put on extended range tanks and I have a, a fuel capacity with the main tanks of about 232 litres and with the reserve tanks 348 litres giving me an endurance of roughly 7.6 hours doing 165 knots if you times that by 1.85, you get kilometres an hour. Mm -hmm. So just to put that into comparison, from here to Wagga, I'm, I'm based in Gawler in South Australia, to Wagga in New South Wales, it's about 2.5 hours. So wow. as a comparative thing, it's a 12 and a half hour drive and uh, you'd probably use a couple of tanks of fuel. And yep. I did that in about with 160 litres of fuel. So it carries four people. The aircraft will carry four people with the main tanks full and a bit of baggage. It's got about uh, 40 kilos of baggage allowance in a baggage bay, quite spacious, and uh, with the main tanks full, it's about two and a half people and a bit of baggage, yeah. or two people and about 40 kilos of baggage. So it's a true four-seater, so like we had plenty of leg room in the back. So there's plenty yeah. of leg room in the back, plenty of leg room in the front. It's, uh, I've spent the longest flight I've done, it's 3.8 hours to date, and uh, you don't even know that you've been sitting down, it's more comfortable than a car. The seats I've had done by Custom Aero in the USA, and um, they've got Confor foam, which is a uh, an impact resistant foam sort of for heavy knocks and for uh, basically to, to comfort, to uh, support your back and especially the lumbar. Uh -huh. And it's exceptionally um, comfortable to fly around in that aircraft for yeah. three or more hours. Um, the aircraft is fitted with um, what they call an electronic flight information system and it uses a module called an ADA HARS, which is basically an electronic gyro and it can. Uh, couple a navigation system into that with GPS and uh, through an autopilot steer the aircraft around the course mm -hmm. once you program in through the autopilot nice. and, and through the uh, EFIS. So it's an easy aircraft to fly, it, uh, its maximum speed is 220 knots <laughs> and its stall speed is 52 knots clean without flap and 46 knots with flap. Yeah. So it's got a huge usable range 
and uh, the normal configuration is about uh, 2300 RPM and uh, roughly 23 inches manifold pressure and you do 165 knots roughly true airspeed yep. with that setting and it's uh, also been f I've fitted up an oxygen system to the aircraft and it can climb to the certified ceiling is 20,000 feet but the best sweet spot to fly for best performance and best fuel economy is around between 12 to 15,000 feet okay. and uh, you should get exceptionally good um, what uh, do you pick up like true airspeed then won't pick up much in the way of true airspeed still will do about 165 knots uh -huh. but uh, the fuel economy will go from about 43 44 litres an hour to uh -huh. about probably close to 39 litres an hour um, at wow. that level so you're saving a lot of fuel and you're doing a lot uh, sort of faster because it's a little bit thinner air as well yeah so your uh, actual indicated airspeed um, will you know be a little bit oh, it's a constant speed propeller so oh. it's got a pitch lever in the aircraft cockpit okay. and it's a blue lever once you have a look inside yeah and uh, the mixture setting is also a pilot adjustable we've also fitted a ram air system to it and the ram air system is operated with a butterfly valve from inside the cockpit and that allows me to get about another 1.2 inches of manifold pressure um, at height but it's unfiltered air so I don't take off with it and la don't land with it so oh I think I noticed it before there's a butterfly there is in a there. butterfly valve so currently the air is being filtered like in a normal vehicle type filtration system and it goes into the fuel servo and then after that it goes into the engine once the fuel servo mixes the right amount of fuel air mix uh -huh. and uh, with the butterfly open it'll get another 1.2 inches of manifold pressure so, you so just do that once you're at height yeah away so from the away from the ground the bugs and things dust. yeah and producing a little bit more power at height, uh, okay. up to a greater height, okay. essentially. So it's not turbocharged, yeah. but it's, it's a poor man's turbocharger. Yeah, and no, I've never uh, heard of it. Without uh, having a lot of complexity as you would have in the turbocharging system. Yeah. And um, you said the engine was custom built. Why? Did, like, what did you get out of it being custom built? Um, I guess I went with a, a group that produces engines for uh, racing aircraft in the USA, uh -huh. and uh, they're very well known. It's essentially a lay combing engine, but uh, they, they purchased a core and they built it up from, from basically certified parts. Uh -huh. And um, you can have it, if I wanted to have high compression pistons, I could have done that as well. Uh -huh. But uh, they did port match a lot of things and they did some, some, some balancing okay. that uh, you wouldn't get in a normal engine. So you're running basically standard compression, but you've got it ported. Correct, yeah. Ah. So they did a little bit of work for me. So on the dyno, it produces 263 horsepower. Yeah, okay. uh, instead of what, about one uh, oh, it's two normally 260 30. it's rated at 260 okay yeah. but um, they are getting engines with this sort of with high compression pistons somewhere they're about 290 horsepower yeah so but, I um, think you're going fast enough though aren't you I think we're going fast enough and um, you start burning more fuel and more e exactly, temperature yeah, and exactly so um, I run at Lena Peak so mm -hmm. I'm using um, every cylinder has an exhaust gas temperature gauge and a cylinder head temperature gauge it's an alloy head, essentially, uh -huh. so we want to keep the uh, alloy heads less than 430 degrees, 450 degrees. Typically, I'm running at 350 degrees. So yeah, okay. trying to really run it cool in the cylinder head yeah. and um, whatever the exhaust gas temperature is at Lena Peak, whatever that comes out to, typically would come out to about 1350 degrees. We're talking about Fahrenheit, all these temperatures yeah. are in Fahrenheit. Okay. Okay. So we're just a bit of a walk around. So yeah. the cows, Again, just did some different modifications on this. So we've got, you can't see the join between the top cow and the bottom cow. There's a bit of a joggle there. And there's a, unfortunately some blistering here that the paint is um, getting a bit attacked by some of the heat coming off the engine. So I'm gonna have to do some, a little bit more bit work on that. heat shielding in there. The heat shielding. Um, normally it would have a pin with a sort of a, an, an arm sticking out of there. So this is a bit of an aftermarket bling. And uh, there's a, an, behind that is actually the pin ah. that goes through the hinge. Neat. and uh, attaches the top cow to the bottom cow and instead of going with the kit standard of having a hinge on the top and bottom cow on the firewall I've gone with these sky bolt fasteners okay. so they're stainless steel they're very well made and um, but they come at a price so yeah. but uh, I wouldn't change that for when you for say hinge you mean like and then you run that piano wire through it yeah so this doesn't have that so yeah the only hinge is through the center all these are sky bolt fasteners they're quarter okay. turn fasteners nice um, also change these are uh, Hartwell latches and they're just like a little push button latch. You see them on 737s and other big aircraft and they're just a lot, lot neater fit on the oil door and um, basically allows you to get better access to the oil door instead of having a very um, archaic setup that was uh, initially proposed by the manufacturer. Yeah. Um, I guess these are the advantages of kit building yourself. It's right, yeah. So 
You know, the windscreen is basically fitted into the aircraft with a poly um, adhesive, like a, a two-pack um, polyurethane adhesive. And then there's fiberglass layers that make this contour. So there's about uh, 15 layers of fiberglass making up this contour. And um, you basically have to finish that off. Oh, you do that to, yourself? You've got to do that yourself. So you can imagine the windscreen coming down and mating up with this surface here. You would have been a, a join, something like that. You've got to make up that, uh, that fillet, essentially. Oh, wow. So there's about 15 layers of cloth in there and um, basically um, going from one side to the other and then uh, conforming that with um, micro and um, all sorts of other composite material. How do you and, get uh, it so perfect with the windscreen there? <laughs> it's just a, just a lot of hard work. And, and a lot uh, of sanding? I, 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 can, I credit that. I, I put out a, a very big credit to Henry Schultz, okay. a very uh, prominent aircraft builder uh, for in here in South Australia. He's built all sorts of things from uh, air cams to Lance Air 4 ps to all sorts of things. Uh, okay. So he's very uh, uh, acquitted to working with uh, composites. So. Yeah. And so um, the windscreen would have been covered so you don't scratch that obviously? And yeah, the windscreen was covered uh, partly during construction but uh, obviously you've got to join it at some stage so there was some, basically the, the edges were exposed and, and then the, the main part of the windscreen okay. uh, covered with a, uh, a self-adhesive plastic. Yeah. And why did they, I only recently found this out when I knew we were coming for a fly with you. Yeah. And researched a bit. You've got the fiberglass cockpit area, but then yes. you've got aluminium each end. I guess it's easy to work with. Um, Vans traditionally does a lot of uh, composites um, on the uh, tip fairings and on the around the cockpit area. Yeah. And um, I guess this was the, the material of choice. So the fiberglass basically is this bit here, mm -hmm. and that sits into the metal frame, and basically uh, the, the rear windows and just behind that to back basically the tail cone is fiberglass. All the yeah. rest is the aluminium uh, T6 uh, tempered uh, composite, uh, sorry, tempered aluminium uh -huh. uh, sheet, and that's all bent to suit. A lot of the parts come prefabricated, but a lot of the parts you've got to bend in situ and make up formers. So this front quarter section in here has to be bent by me, and uh, that's the same on the other side and the same on the rear section. So they okay. come as flat sheet and have to be bent um, in the workshop to suit. In terms of the interior, again, it's up to the individual builder how, how sort of uh, far they want to go with detail and how far they want to go to make it look like yeah. either a Porsche or, or a, a Holden yeah. or, a, or a Ute. So again, you know, the upholstery and the, and the way that's done, um, that was pretty well, the colours were selected by my wife and the materials came from the States and um, we just got that upholstered in the States and then some of the materials sent across and we had the local upholsterer um, um, trimmed by Mooch, uh -huh. Adam DeRose, helped me do a lot of the uh, upholstery and uh, come up with the leather uh, accents and, and some of the other little stud accents yeah. and whatnot and, and uh, helped me sort of uh, make sure that it looks like a, a very professional job. Yeah. Likewise, the interior handles and the exterior handles were all um, also uh, scratch built as were some additional fitments like the cam that goes in the centre yeah. and uh, that uh, was fitted on the basis of having some in-service failures of doors um, where they would flex and so I've made the door quite rigid and the doors are quite heavy and um, so it's a little chance of flexing but uh, that little cam gives an added uh, level of security and, and yeah. safety. The aircraft empty weighs 810 kilos and the uh, usable maximum takeoff weight is 1,350 kilos. So there's a, quite a usable load and uh, if you put out uh, roughly 348 litres of fuel times 0.7 gives you the weight of the fuel. So we're roughly talking about maybe 200, say 280 to 300 kilos of fuel. It gives you uh, the rest of the usable load as passengers and, and baggage. Yeah. So again, very uh, um, plenty, sort of yeah. uh, plenty of usable load. And what about um, CG? Like CG, um, typically if I fly by myself, I carry 40 kilos of sand in the back because the aircraft is quite nose heavy okay. um, and not tail heavy. So you know, I need that extra weight. Otherwise, um, I tend to lose a bit of rudder, uh, elevator authority huh. on the uh, final. It, fl it flies really well um, with four people on board. As you saw today, we touched down quite nicely oh, yeah. um, without even a, a bump because it just everything's really nicely balanced. Uh, it does like a bit of air flowing over the horizontal stabiliser on the landing. So you just can't cut the throttle and, and land it like a glider uh -huh. because you tend to lose a lot of airflow and then a lot of uh, 
pitch authority if you don't have any, any airflow mm, going from the engine. So I still keep a bit of uh, low revs, you know, probably about 1,000 RPM <coughs> or less, and instead of just uh, pulling the throttle right back on the touchdown. Okay. And then uh, closing the throttle fully Is that once. sort of not enough to make thrust so much, but just yeah. stops the um, propeller being an air brake more so and oh, disturbing so the flow? No, that doesn't disturb the flow, but it uh, just gives a little bit just more enough. flow across the horizontal stabiliser. It makes it, it's, it's still flying the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator. And yeah. I used to fly the Cirrus SR20 and they had the same issue. Yeah. Um, it just likes a bit of air flowing across, that bit of laminar flow to make that elevator effective. Is that partly because they go with small tail feathers to reduce drag? Uh, and I don't think they're quite small tail feathers, but it's, uh, I guess it must have something to do with the angle of a attack as you're coming into flare. Ah, okay. And um, it might get a bit shielded with ground effect. So having yep. that, a bit of extra airflow might make it a little bit uh, yeah. more sort of, uh, elevator authority on that yep. very close to the ground. Is this uh, wing root fairing there, is that an uh, added thing you did? Yeah, the, uh, this, this came from Jesse Saint in, in America. Oh. Jesse uh, uh, sent across a couple of these for my aircraft and another aircraft. It's normally just a, a, a piece of aluminium that would give you a 90 degree fit. And if you look at the thing head on, it gives you a nice oh. fared fitting. Oh, and um, nice. by doing that, the stall speed is reduced by about two knots, two to three knots. Okay. Um, it doesn't sound like much, but uh, any reduction in stall speed is a good um, option to do. Also, then um, your like the drag at cruise would be significant. Like yeah, you get a lot more cruise it, speed it, out of it. Not a lot, a lot more cruise speed, but less, a little bit less um, parasitic drag. Yeah. So, if you see it in that configuration there, you'll notice that there's a gap between the flap and the fairing. Yeah. So that's in a zero degree flap setting. And then there's a minus three degree reflex flap setting for the cruise. Oh, really? So it, it's got reflex flap. And pipistrels have that, so, yeah. don't they? And not many aircraft have got that. It's uh, quite a unique feature to the van's fleet. Um, and that minus three gives you a bit better cruise speed at, at yeah. speed. And it does, you know, fr from the testing that myself and other builders have done, it does add a little bit of extra cruise. We're not talking about a lot, but maybe three or four knots. Uh -huh. you know. um, yeah, we looked, um, I first found out about that wing root fairing from um was it the a ar5 yeah was it mike arnold okay have you seen no, that guy no he broke some speed record with 65 horsepower okay. did over 200 mile an hour yeah and i yeah sort of by accident he discovered doing that wing root fairing yep. is what reduced his drag so yeah. much and i think he got the idea from mustangs Not, uh, probably yeah so i guess the only thing i didn't do which i was thinking putting vortex generators on it I didn't put, I was very close to doing the Vortex generator thing, but I, didn't, I didn't, haven't done it. So yeah. um, I don't know too many tens that have got Vortex generators. Um, I don't think it's really a necessary thing. The aircraft is not a short takeoff or landing aircraft. I roughly need 800 metres to make it comfortable uh -huh. um, just to be safe. So What uh, would the uh, Vortex generators achieve? It might uh, give you a little bit of extra sort of low speed handling performance. Yeah. Um, uh, it might sort of reduce the stall speed a little bit, but uh, again, it would be experimenting to see if that actually worked rather yeah. than as a, a fictional thing. So Is that the mechanical engineer in you that just wants to test yeah, those I things? Guess, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just wanting to fly the aircraft now. So yeah. um, I'm just, anecdotally, I don't know too many other RV-10s with, with Vortex generators. I think they typically work better with high wing aircraft too. Okay. So What's the theory with that, being better on high oh, wings? It just gives you a bit better laminar flow, my understanding is. So, But uh, yeah. I, I don't think, look, it's not an aerobatic aircraft. It's not going to have... A lot of high angle of attack. Uh, we're doing a, a typical cruise climb at about 110 to 120 knots. Depends what we, what the temperature is on the day. Yeah. If it's a really hot day, we'll probably reduce that to you know somewhere about 120 mm -hmm. to uh, keep more air going through the engine. But um, on a cooler day, it's got uh, a climb rate with four of us on board of about 1,500 feet a minute. So yeah, plenty. So it's uh, it, it climbs quite nicely, and it will keep on climbing well above 10,000 feet. It just has a lovely wing that just loves to climb. It's a very thick wing, yeah. which also another reason to go up to the high uh, altitudes and, and early flight levels to let that wing go through some thinner air and yeah. um, give it less uh, and air resistance, a bit more penetration. The negative flaps too offsets the thick wing, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, but it's just, again, it's a whole bunch of experimentation. There's a, another colleague of mine with an RV-10 uh, at a Redcliffe in New South, uh, Queensland, Ashley Miller currently experimenting with a whole bunch of fairings around the exhaust and looking at potentially reducing drag in that area and look, potentially looking at another 20 to 30 knots increase in cruise speed. Wow. So Ashley's uh, doing a lot of uh, great work in that uh, uh, area to look at uh, how we can better minimise a lot of the drag coming through. 
to do with cooling drag as well? Yeah, it's it? cooling drag as well, but also parasitic drag coming through there. So yeah. um, I haven't fitted any mechanical gauges as backups. Um, I've got a, basically an advanced flight systems um, set up. I'd like to uh, really put out my acknowledgement out to Rob Hickman from Advanced Flight Systems, an exceptional piece of equipment and an exceptional man that provides uh, exceptional after sales service yeah. to try to get the experimental aircraft builder up and flying and nut out any technical problems that come through. And also uh, a Dynan D100 EFIS as a backup uh, emergency instrument with its own battery supply. Oh, yeah. um, right. The aircraft's got two electrical systems that run of two lithium iron batteries, not ion as in uh, what's in your toys and, and things, but iron. So, and they weigh about 1.4 kilos. And there's uh, two electrical buses and two alternators. So there's a, the standby alternator which comes off the back of the engine and uh, produces about uh, roughly 40 amps. And that just runs as a standby all the time. And the primary alternator off the front of the engine, off the uh, propeller, uh, flywheel through a, a belt and that produces about 60 amps. Okay. Typical flight consumption is about 34 amps with everything running and um, that's with all the lights. Um, I initially fitted strobe lights, uh, the old conventional strobes there, and uh, with a strobe pack had I do, you know, waited there's more efficient LED lighting now which reduces power consumption so yeah. a lot of my lighting is still conventional. I've got uh, high intensity discharge landing lights all that again would be reduced down to LED. So yeah. it probably would reduce electrical consumption by another probably 10 to 15 amps. Yeah. I was saying to Bailey earlier today, because um, you started this project what, 18 years ago? Yeah, the, the whole project was a bit of a crazy project. It took me 17 years, nine months and 24 days. And there's a lot of births, deaths and marriages in that time. And, and uh, you know, passing of uh, family members and dogs and cats and yeah. and uh, graduations and universities and work and you know stopping and starting so um, it was a, a just a great project to keep me motivated and I tell people it's a, essentially it's a it's a big science project so, yeah. so but it's a, an exceptional piece of equipment to uh, run around in it uh, currently is only certified for day VFR and it won't uh, take much to get it for night VFR and um, it also can be certified for instrument flight rules um, okay. I've got everything in here that I need for instrument flight rules flying um, I actually did test the instrument landing system a couple of weeks ago and everything works fine in that in that system so yeah nice also um, getting back to saying about how long it took you to build um, and say the lights you'd go LED now what about um, like the instruments did you were they the last things you purchased because no of that? I, I actually purchased them too early to be honest with you so I advise anyone if they're going to build an aircraft like this to purchase all your instruments at the last minute and do it while the technology is still fresh yeah. because um, even the processes on the main EFA screens primary and uh, multifunction display I had to send them back to the states and, and Rob Hickman and advanced flight systems upgraded the processes on those ah. and uh, since the evolution of the first version I had to what is in there now they came up with touch screens as well so it's all touch screens. The, the GPS is a Garmin GTN 750, and I've got a backup um, communication to radio with Garmin as well, and all the audio panel, and the transponder, and the um, uh, the GPS it all runs, and the navigation system runs through the Garmin GTN 750. Okay. So a very compact and very powerful piece of equipment in itself. Yeah. And that links into the advanced flight systems EFIS and, and uh, multifunction display. Yeah. Yes, when you're flying as fast as this plane flies, having more autopilots, navigation and all of that stuff helps a lot, managing... It does. The autopilot's good for, for basically load shedding. Yeah. Um, it allows you to then do other things like manage fuel consumptions and, and work out uh, navigational estimates on, and just double checking what the GPS is doing. Yeah. Uh, I don't rely fully on, on the trust of the GPS. I, I keep an eye on what it's doing and, yeah. and where it's taking me, and also planning on uh, managing airspace um, requirements so I don't uh, breach any airspace um, entry yeah. and making sure I get clearances where I need to. So you really need to be on top of the aircraft. Especially and, uh, around here. Especially around here, but even on longer trips and going into remote areas um, where there's sort of uh, aerodromes where there's uh, military airspace or other private airspace around, you've got to keep your eye on what you're doing, or especially with... Uh, regular public transport operations coming into those places as well. So yeah. talking to other pilots and uh, the ADSB in and out is an invaluable tool as we saw today. Um, there was some fire bombers on our track um, below us 
and uh, we try to avoid them and give them priority so they can do their work. Yeah. Would you do it again? Would I do it again? Yeah, probably <laughs> would do it again if I had more time. It takes a lot of time and yeah. uh, it's a lot of uh, devotion of time. You need to really spend at least one day a weekend on this every weekend. Okay. Otherwise you lose continuity and, and if you have time, it's, it really you want to do two days a weekend and some nights during the week as well. Yeah. Um, what would a, you say you sort of average then? Like I was trying to do probably at least one or two nights during the week and uh, one day every weekend yeah and towards the end of it um, from when it arrived here from the painters to the first flight that was about a year's worth of work um, trying to get everything together um, you know even though it was all built just uh, adjusting things and testing things and making sure it conforms to all the uh, the manufacturer's requirements uh -huh. so then from that process you get a provisional certificate to fly and then you've got to do um, a flight test program over 25 hours within a uh, an airspace boundary. Mine was 100 nautical miles from Gawler. Yeah. But it sounds like a big area, but uh, this thing does 165 nautical miles an hour. Yeah. So it, you know, it's only less than about an hour and a bit, you know, flying out of the airspace. So it's, yeah. this thing eats the airspace like crazy. And you've so only, because of the airspace here with Adelaide and Edinburgh, you, all your airspace is north, isn't correct, it? Correct. Yeah. So you know, even with 100 nautical miles, it's less than an hour to get out to the outer range of the 100 nautical miles. Yeah. So to fly across the whole thing, 200 nautical miles is just over an hour. So yeah. you, know, you quickly eat up airspace trying to do things and, and yeah. test things. So you obviously you want to do things away from populated areas when you're yeah. testing uh, things like stalls and, and upper air work. It's not aerobatic, but it can do some, you know, basically a lazy eight would be about the one G maneuver that could do that overstressing the airframe. Yeah. Obviously it's rated to go well beyond that, but just... Yeah, so about 220 knots is the manufacturer's um, yeah. rated uh, speed. You don't want to go be going over that. You can encounter a, a, a problem called flutter, mm -hmm. and you don't want to get into that sort of realm to be a true test pilot. You yeah. know, you're actually trying to certify that the aircraft can fly within the yeah. uh, the envelope that the manufacturer has given you. Is so. flutter the control surfaces fluttering, or is it the whole aerofoil? Um, the whole aerofoil can. Have, uh, you can see pictures on YouTube where the whole horizontal stabilizer does this sort of thing. And that does a warpy sort of thing and uh, the whole thing it set, it sets up like a wave and obviously by doing that it's creating a lot of stress on the metal and uh, obviously the, the worst case scenario there's a destructive failure in flight yeah if you had your time again as well would you do the rv10 or oh yeah i'd, I'd do the rv10 again yeah. um i think if vans produces the rv15 ultimately into production it's a high wing um aircraft for short field. I wouldn't, I'd, I'd be seriously thinking about potentially going to that, but it's a, yeah. it's a bit of a toy and uh, it'd be limited in where you can take it in this sort of area. It'd so be a bit of an all-rounder, the RV-15, yeah, I guess. But yeah, if it's a bush aeroplane. It's designed yeah. to be a bush aeroplane. With a little bit of cruise so, speed still. But uh, this is a true touring aeroplane. It'll sit yeah. nice and comfortable above, um, you know, the, the bumps. And, uh, you know, if you take it up to twelve to 15,000, getting out of most of the summer bumps in Australia yeah. and uh, give you a very good ride that could probably be you're doing about half the speed of the jet so by the time you factor in going to the airport an hour before and checking in going through security waiting for your bag and all that sort of thing you're going to beat the jet in most cases yeah so yeah yeah and if you're sitting in the back of a jet all you want to be doing is sitting up the front of it <laughs> that's right like not having so, any of the fun and exactly so but it's a very rewarding experience can yeah. highly recommend it and uh any trips planned like obviously it's a I guess uh, I've still got a few other little bugs to iron out. Um, I just want to do an, an injector balance on the engine to get everything nicely balanced. And it's just a slight bit of lag on a couple of cylinders to get them uh, lean of peak. Okay. But uh, I'll get that balanced. Then uh, my, my trip this year that I'd like to do is go up to Mackay to visit my daughter. Nice. So do a cross country when the uh, weather is more sort of conducive uh, rather than the wet season that they've got that over yeah. the summer months that we experience here in the southern states. Yeah, you get some pretty turbulent air yep. during the wet season. And a lot of, lot of water too. And then with the modifications, because you've built it and it's experimental. You, you haven't gone radically away from the uh, manufacturer specifications. You haven't done anything, you haven't made it a biplane, you haven't made it anything sort of radically different. You've made some small minor changes, yeah. um, but essentially you're still maintaining the manufacturer's intended product. Okay. and you haven't varied from that significantly. So um, I've been through a CASA approved delegate to get that process assessed and he's uh, looked at my figures and um, essentially uh, I've submitted the flight test program to that uh, delegate to make sure that um, you know, he's gone across my um, sort of testing program to make sure it complies and, and 
addresses that the aircraft is still fit to fly and airworthy. Okay. And if you got this as a factory built aircraft, could you not do any modifications? Or? Well, you couldn't. So if Vans builds a thing called an RB12, and the RB12 is designed as a sports aircraft, and Vans is quite stringent in saying you must build the aircraft in this configuration with these instruments and in that weight limit. So every one of those is intended to be the same uh, weight okay. and the same configuration to comply with the sports aircraft limitations. Okay. So it's not in the experimental category. And um, even if you build it yourself, even if you build it yourself, they, oh. they try to keep them all the same relatively. Your brother and I briefly looked at building one yeah, of them. Yeah. So they tell you which instruments to put in it. So you've, you're pretty well limited to what Vans tells you to put in it, essentially. But um, that's designed so it complies as a sports aircraft, and they're all relatively the same weight-wise and performance-wise. Okay. And and even the RV10s, despite their um, cosmetic differences, are all pretty well the same in terms of performance-wise. There's not too many that are radically um, above this performance. There's a, another one that I know of based here in, in South Australia that's got a two turbochargers. It's turbo normalised, and that will obviously sustain power in the, into the flight levels. But um, you know that still airframe is still restricted to the 200 knot maximum ah, okay. because uh, the, you just can't go faster. You can't put a, a big engine and go faster because you're getting up to very close to that 200 knots. And yeah. And obviously. The airframe and the. Yeah, and that obviously that high speed is at smooth air. Yeah. As soon as you go into rough air or turbulence, you've got to reduce the speed back to 130 knots. Yeah. So. Um, when you, you say turbo normalised. Um, I think I know what that means, but can you just briefly explain it? I guess essentially it's got a turbo charging system that uh, recovers the exhaust gases and puts them through a turbo charger that improves the amount of air going into the engine through, through a, a turbo. Yeah. So you're basically um, uh, injecting the, the inlet air into the engine under pressure. Yeah. So and the normalised part is that it just continues the horsepower up to a certain Correct. height? Correct, yeah. yeah. So that height, I know that um, the owner of that aircraft flies to 22,000 feet uh -huh. and has flown the aircraft to 22,000 feet. So, you know, that just uh, allows you to fly up to that sort of level with the same sort of, uh, I guess, uh, inlet air to, to, to mix into the engine Continue and the same amount of fuel. And give you the same amount of horsepower, essentially. So yeah. with mine, I'm reliant on the manifold pressure and uh, with my ram air, I might get a 1.2 no, 1 inches, but the higher you go, the less the manifold pressure and less the performance. Yeah. So the performance degrades. So that's where the sweet spot of the aircraft is around 12 to 15,000 feet. Yeah. That, yeah, there's a lot less oxygen available at that height. Correct. Isn't there, so. Yeah, but the, by doing that, also you're consuming less fuel yeah. and you're saving on fuel for the same amount of speed. So there's, yeah. there's a bit of a win, and there's a bit of a loss as well. Yeah. So. All right. Nice. Wrap it up, eh? Thank you. Yeah, thanks each for taking us for a fly and um, haven't seen you for, what, 25 years? <laughs> yes. So I was yeah. pretty thanks. much Bailey's age yeah, when... So, uh, so Michael was one of my cadets. Um, I'm in the yeah. Australian Air Force cadets and that's a great organisation to uh, develop a spirit of aviation and adventure as well yeah. and personal development. Yeah. So. Yeah, and meet good people and, yeah. yeah. It's good to get back in touch. Patrick yeah. ran an air traffic control course. I think that was back in 96. Yeah, so I ran 12, course, 12 consecutive courses yeah. so in the mid-90s right through. So Yeah, yeah so spent a week on the RAF base and ours was when the, it was the first year of the Adelaide 500. So we were sitting up in the Adelaide Tower watching the F-18 Hornets and yeah. the Whitman's Blimp fly around the racetrack. It was a, it was a good experience. Good to pass yeah, on yeah. some knowledge. So yeah, and right. yeah, obviously we appreciate Patrick taking us for a fly. And no worries. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, yeah. Bailey. RV10, probably yeah. sitting on about 300 kilometres an hour, 160 knots or so, 50 nautic mile flight. So, yeah, what do you think of that? Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, it's good with climbed above like the inversion layer off the bumps, and it's nice and smooth. Yeah, it was it's a little bit bumpy down yeah, low, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, you had to keep it under 130 knots uh, for the rough air. But yeah, then it was dead smooth once you got above the inversion. Yeah, the inversion layer wasn't too high. Yeah, I don't know. A couple of thousand feet? Yeah, something like that. So yeah, we flew up to clear and 
landed there, the wind, we went coming into land, we went from having a headwind to a pretty decent crosswind, um, made a pretty sporting landing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Patrick did a good job of it. Yeah, we saw some interesting landings, a lot of them didn't want to use the cross strip, maybe they're up for the challenge, I think. I, yeah, I did see a Jamaroo use the cross strip. Yeah, and I saw one Cessna use the cross strip. Yeah. Which I think was probably a good idea. If we took our plane now, I think I would have been using the cross strip with the, it's not a crazy amount of wind, but it's enough. And we got a big wing and slow plane, so it's a, a very big component for us. Yeah. What do you think about the plane? Yeah, it has really nice like finish on the inside. Like, yeah, like very much like a commercially built plane. Yeah. A factory built plane, I should say. Yeah. Claire puts on a good sort of event, like it was just a pretty quickly organised thing, I think. But yeah, it's good to get up there and have burgers were cooking on arrival, and we were one of the first planes, but then uh, a fair few started showing up, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, good. 15 planes, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. It wasn't as many as that time when you broke your arms. Oh, that was heaps then, wasn't it? Yeah. This was a pretty quick little, like, yeah. it had planned to put it out a couple of weeks ago. And, I mean, the weather was nice enough considering the time of year. It's summer here at the moment. And, you know, I was up, had a 42 degree day in Port Augusta the other day. So, today was probably high 20s, I guess, 20 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's autumn and spring time they'll get a lot more film. It's just good to support a place like Clare. They, they you know, have done a good job of that airfield. Yeah. I think yeah. Well, maybe 15, 20 years ago it was just a paddock. Yeah. They got a tarmac strip, north south strip, and a, and a grass cross strip. Yeah. Yeah, nice club rooms. And, Courtesy cars for you to yeah. um, oh, if anyone's interested with that um, wing root fairing, that uh, Mike Arnold, I think, the AR5, you can look that up. And uh, it's a bit of an old video, but it goes into explaining how he broke the 200 mile an hour record with a 65 horsepower plane yeah and um the wing route fairing um had a lot to do with that and also where the like canopy was placed because of the where the air pressure is yeah so like, moving the canopy right back so the high point of the canopy it was it, yeah I don't, was it level with the trailing edge something like that and it like yeah i guess flattened out like the um way the airflow through there yeah so he was looking at it and like you have um planes like the trojan and you see like they have over the wing they have all that because of the exhaust from up the front of the engine they have yeah. that like silver or whatever or black oh. black Sorry. paint that goes up over the aerofoil and down and um he noticed that the exhaust or whatever, yeah, the way it flows over the wing. And so by moving the canopy back, so you've got, you know, the camber of the wing here and the camber of the canopy, typically it's like that, I guess, for visibility. Yeah. So you can see over the leading edge and so on. But he moved his canopy back, so the high point of his canopy was level with the trailing edge. And that exhaust flow goes straight so much so, so that I think his exhaust was hitting his... Uh, horizontal stabiliser yeah. and he reckons he probably could get a little bit more speed out of his plane if the, that wasn't happening mm. you see his oil slick or exhaust maybe it's his exhaust just straight down the yeah. fuselage he nailed it alright we're at the farm now aren't we yeah I guess wrap the video up yeah, yeah.